The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists, and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. Is Jesus God? Migrant workers and human rights from a Christian perspective. Marriage and family. ISIS presents a much bigger threat. How do we integrate the Bible with our scientific understanding? Are you able to actually describe and articulate clearly your own sense of purpose in life? I've been asked to speak on the culture of life. And by the way, this culture of life is a reflection also of the encyclica written by St. John Paul II in 1995, Evangelium Vitae. It is very significant that this um, encyclica was written about 20 uh, 18 years ago, we can see the profound insight of John Paul II when he wrote this encyclical. And it is still as relevant today as it was in his days. And it is John Paul II who coined the terms culture of life and culture of death. Now, at the onset of his pontificate, there were two fundamental threats to Christianity in the contemporary world. Basically, Marxism, Communism, and Consumerism. Now, these two are very much related because atheism ultimately, in a godless world, will result in materialism and consumerism. And so it is important for us, therefore, when we want to reflect on the culture of life, we have to understand that when John Paul II offers his encyclical, it is not just meant for Christians alone, it is meant for all religions, non-believers, so that all are called to respect, protect, love, and serve life. Every human life. Without respect for life, we cannot speak of peace. We cannot speak of freedom and happiness. Now, before we speak on the tensions and those issues that affect our world today, I think it's important for us as Christians, to try to underpin our theological, uh, scriptural foundations before we attempt to uh, reflect on these tensions. Otherwise, we will not be able to understand where non-believers are coming from. Why we differ in the way we understand the culture of life. And so, right from the start, there are two important foundations, prerequisite, that we need to be clear in our mind before we even attempt to ad deliberate on those issues connected with the culture of death. Firstly, we need to know our Christian anthropology. Without a real understanding of Christian anthropology, we will not be able to systematically present our position with respect to the culture of life. So the point of departure, therefore, with respect to the protection of the life of the human person would differ from the world. Because our point of departure presupposes a faith departure that is taught in scripture and 
in tradition. So without an understanding of Christian anthropology, then we can understand and also appreciate why the world does not agree with us on some issues regarding the human person. His or her identity, sexuality for that matter, not just issues dealing with human life. And of course, our purpose on earth, the ultimate destiny. So, <clears throat> I believe that much of the debate on the culture of death has to do with our own presuppositions. So, right from the start, what is the understanding of man? Firstly, the Bible is clear. Man is created in the image and likeness of God. This is the fundamental starting point in order to speak about the dignity of the human person. Pope St. John Paul said, this is the basis, therefore, the image of God is the immutable basis of all Christian anthropology. So in Genesis 1, 26, 28, two important points emerge. Firstly, we have a clear expression of the relationship between God, creator, man, his creature. Now we are told that man is made in the image of God by an act of the divine will. But what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What are the implications? Firstly, to be created in God's image means to say human beings have a very special relationship with God. And of course, we fellow human beings. And the first implication of being associated with God is the call to subdue the world together with God. But it's important to recognize this. To subdue the world does not mean that man has been given absolute power over creation. Man remains forever subservient to God, his creator. And secondly, to be created in God's image means that man has been given dominion over creatures, but not over other human beings. So it is from this we get a hint at the relationship between humans who are created in the image of God. Man is called to exercise dominion over the rest of creation, but not dominion over fellow human beings. And so it's important to recognize that the creatures partaking of God's absolute power over creation is the consequence of being made in the image of God. And as human beings, therefore, we are called to be good stewards. We are called to help other creatures, including non-human beings, to reach their potential for the service of humanity. Of course, there are some of you who do not eat meat, but I always tell people, especially when I'm eating, and then they don't finish the food on the table, especially if it is a chicken or is a, what we call a beef steak. I say, how could you do such a thing? Because that animal does not reach its potentials. <laughs> because he is born to give you food and you don't eat the food that you cook, you actually not being good stewards. Now, to be good stewards is to make sure that the chicken is fully eaten. Then he feels great that he has not sacrificed his life for nothing. <laughs> now, to be made in the image of God, therefore, it means that it's unlawful for human beings to dominate other humans, much less to harm him. So, killing other humans thus is a grave offence to God simply because every single human being traces back to God, from God, and because he is a reflection of God himself. So in creating God, God has actually expressed something of himself. That's why to be created the image of God means to say that we therefore share in his intellect, 
in His will, and we have the capacity to love and to choose. So, but at the same time, there is something of us for us to take note as well. In Genesis 1, 26, 8, image of God is also linked to the distinction between the sexes and the propagation of the human species. The division of mankind into male and female is also associated with the divine mandate to be fruitful and multiply. Now, procreation is also a consideration because procreation means to say a man and a woman becomes partners with God, not only in the giving of life to the newborn, but also in transmitting the image of God. So that's why man is in a very special, a privileged position because we are created in God's image. But of course, we know that although we are created the image and likeness of God, the fathers of the church say because of sin, we have lost that likeness. And that's why some of us look a little bit like the evil one. Huh? But, uh, uh, but, uh, but the, the, what we call the image is not lost. We remain forever the image of God. But the likeness has been lost because we have been disfigured by sin. Now, in order to rediscover or to recover our image, and therefore the likeness, we have to go to Christ. That's why in the New Testament, Christ is presented as the image of God the Father. In St. Paul's letter to Colossians, in chapter 1, verse 15, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And he is also both in terms of creation, in terms of salvation. More beautifully, in the letter of Hebrews, in chapter 1, verse 3, Christ reflects the glory of God and bears the very stem of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. So it is from Christ that we are given this perfect image which we must reproduce in our own life. And that is the reason why man is called to eternal life in the image of Christ because only Christ is the unique and true image of God. In fact, the fathers of the church says, uh, we are created in view of the incarnation, in view of Christ who is the image of God. And so, in that sense, we become children of God through faith in Christ. So it is through the Son that we learn who the Father and what the Father truly is. And it is only in Christ that we understand who we are. In fact, in the good counsel, in Gaudium Espes, the church says, Christ reveals man to man himself. Who is a true man? Look at Jesus. Who is a true man? Who is a person who is truly alive? We look at Jesus. That's why Jesus in John chapter 14, the 6, is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is for us the paradigm, the model of how we should live our life. No one else. Now, <clears throat> this image of God, therefore, is the basis, the root of human dignity. Now, when we are in dialogue with people who are non-Christian, um, there are two ways to discuss about the dignity of the human person. One is inadequate, but there is no choice. What I want to say is this, a full discussion, a reflection of the dignity of the human person is based on theology and salvation history. But we can carry out a philosophical reflection within the sphere of justice and natural law. That's the reason why in the study of theology, for us uh, in, a, in a seminary, all theologians have to first study two to three years of philosophy before they study Christian theology. That means scripture and theology and so on. And the simple reason is this. Because philosophy is the only way we can communicate to people who are non-believers. Because their starting point is not faith in the scripture. Their starting point is not faith in Christ. Their starting point is reason. 
And so we need to begin with reason. But of course, we know that uh, reason can only lead us that far. Ultimately, faith is required. But we hope that through reason, a person might be brought to the threshold of faith. And then you just have to take a leap. Because you can reason until the cow comes home and yet you will never uh, have faith. It's like a relationship. Huh? If you were to date somebody in your life and you say, I must use my reason, see, is he good enough? We will try to study his bio data, everything. You can study everything. But in the end, you need to have faith in order to begin a relationship. Because look at all his data, they can be right, can be very good. But it does not mean to say it's guaranteed. <laughs> Nothing is guaranteed. And he can be even be faithful to you for five years of the marriage. But for life, not too sure. That's why you need to have faith. You have to take a leap of faith. And when you have faith, the relationship grows and deepens. So long as you stand on the threshold, you're not going to start the relationship. That's why some people told me, huh? Father, I cannot find a man, I cannot find a woman. Yeah, like, because you're on the threshold. <laughs> you don't take the leap of faith. If a relationship does not start, if your hearts do not open to each other, I don't think you can ever go further than that. And so, this is the case. So, perhaps, as I've said, the only way we can dialogue with the secular world it can be based on presuppositions of faith and of reason. It has its limitations, but at least there is a possible way of dialogue. Otherwise, there is no dialogue. So at least we can come to agree to disagree, at least at some point. At least they do not think that we are making sweeping statements or just subjective statements and our faith is an emotional subjective faith. About faith, faith is personal, but it is also reasonable. It's not unreasonable. So the biblical reference of man created the image of God, therefore serve for us the theological basis for the dignity of the human being. This divine something in each of us is truly an image of God. And so it's a whole person that is to become, in the body of Christ, a temple of the Spirit. So it is a Christian idea of dignity that reflects the incomparable value of every human person. Evangelium VT2. And it is non-negotiable because he has created the image of God. That's the reason why we have such um, um, what we call uh, Faith or we have such, we hold with great value each person. So by virtue of this dignity too, each of us is a brother or sister in Christ. And more than that, because we are created the image of God, when we talk about life, we are not even talking about just human life. We are talking about eternal life. We are talking about supernatural life. So uh, creation is for salvation. Creation is destined for redemption. We must understand that. So, this dignity, therefore, is made more powerful by God's redemption in Christ and when we participate as, in Christ as children of God. So, consequently, for us Christians, the dignity of humans does not depend on their social condition, cultural formation, physical, spiritual development, exterior appearance, age, or philosophical, and even religious convictions. Because every person is created in the image and likeness of God. So that is the first point. We must be clear, this is our Christian anthropology. Now the next point as a foundation is, what about life? from a theological and biblical perspective. Now, Jesus spoke about the heart of his mission. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10.10. 10, huh? Now, as I've said, earthly life is not the only life, nor is it the supreme good for men. In fact, Jesus makes it clear, the one who tries to save his life will lose it. The one who loses his life will save it. 
All the more, therefore, what is even more important is that this earthly life is lived in such a way in view of eternal life, the life that is to come. So by life, Jesus is referring, therefore, to supernatural life, our relationship with God. Actually, life means relationship with God, with others, with ourselves. For this reason, you can be doing very well in life. You can be successful. But actually, that is not a life. That is a lie. That is not a life. A life is only truly alive when you are in relationship. That's why Jesus says, I have come to call you friends. God is interested in a relationship so that we might be in relationship with each other. It's relationship that gives us meaning, that gives us purpose, that gives us life. Uh, to fall into sin is to be cut off from our relationship. That is what sin does. Sin cuts us away from relationship with God, relationship with our brothers and sisters. So by life, therefore, Jesus is referring to a supernatural life which consists of a special relationship with God. Every man is called to this life. <clears throat> And we are called to realize this life to its fullest in eternity. Now, in the Old Testament, in ancient Semitic thought, now life is not also a biological or anthropological concept, but a theological one. So it's good for us to take note. Because very often when we talk of life, we tend to reduce it to biological life. But in the scriptures, life refers to more than biological life. We are talking about life in its fullness, which therefore is a theological concept more than a biological concept. All life comes from God, sustained by God. God is the living God. He is the one who breathed the divine breath, the ruah of life in the rest. So the Bible does not give us precise anthropology, but it describes that life is its unity. So man exists from God and exists only because of God. So we cannot talk about man without God. In fact, man has no place, man has no foundation without God. This is the whole problem of the world today. Because of atheism, because of uh, secularism. When you don't have God as your starting point, the foundation for the dignity of man, the identity of man becomes very weak. I will speak more about this just a little while. So from the perspective, therefore, of the tradition of the church, the human person is a unity of body and soul. And that is why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, St. Paul says, you know, may you be blameless until the coming of Christ, Body, soul, and spirit. St. Irenaeus also said man is comprised of a body, soul, and spirit in unity. So, crime against life, therefore, is a crime against God. The book of wisdom indicates that the death of humans is not the will of God because God did not make death in Wisdom 1.13. Therefore, crime against human life against God himself. You shall not kill the fifth commandment of Decalogue. Now, the virtue of being created in the image of God therefore provides the foundation for the inviolability of human life. As a gift of God, which God gives to man, man cannot do with human life as he wills, including his own life. We are called to exercise his dominion over the world with intelligence, with love. And our responsibility extends to the life of another human being. Therefore, because life is a gift from God, we must look after ourselves well. You know, uh, um, who is that Methodist bishop? I forgot his name. The former Methodist bishop, the, the one in Paliva, what's his name? Uh, 
yeah, Bishop Wee, he would always, and we share the same philosophy, you know, he would always tell me, it's very important, uh, physical health and spiritual health must go together, which is true. You cannot talk about spiritual health without taking care of your bodily health. Because if you love God, not only you will make sure that you're in good relationship with Him, that is your spiritual health, but your bodily health. Because your body is supposed to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 6, 13, 15, 20. And therefore, we need to glorify God with our body. To care for our health is actually to protect the life that God has given to us. Of course, don't be obsessed though, don't be obsessed. Sometimes I just can't believe it, you know, because I see some young people, huh, they can spend two hours in the gym and I say, you don't pray, you're very busy. I say, two hours in the gym, you can, you look after your beautiful body which will rot in no time, but you are not looking after your soul. Come on. Surely you can give at least half an hour and you're so you're obsessed with your bodily body. So that I think we have to uh, see that in what we call uh, in perspective. So understanding the dignity we bear is the resultant of identity as children of God. Therefore, it is clear that the life of a person taken away by another through sin is not just any life, but that of a person who is equally the child of the same divine father. Even God protected Cain, the murderer, from being killed. So, the declaration of Evangelium Vitae, therefore, any direct or intentional killing of an innocent human being is always gravely immoral. Huh? Number seven, it's applied to any voluntary killing. So in the Catholic tradition, there is absolute prohibition of killing. It is one of the sins that cries out to heaven for vengeance and is considered one of the most serious sins. So absolute, without exception, whether it's an embryo, a fetus, or someone who has an incurable disease, no killing is permitted. In the New Testament, the fifth commandment, you shall not kill, is perfected by our Lord. Instead of putting this commandment negatively, he say, love your neighbor as yourself. Do not do unto others what you don't like others to do unto you. So through Christ, therefore, it is not enough just not to kill, we are called to love. Not just not to harm, but we are called to promote life, to promote love. So the moral principle of the inviolability of human life excludes every form of intentional killing of an innocent human being. However, as I've said, we need to qualify. Um, for doctors, healthcare personnel, priests, pastors, who have dedicated themselves to the care of persons, even with those highly infectious diseases, these personal sacrifice may entail losing one's life. That is permissible because human charity is even greater than just protecting yourself. As I've said, in Matthew 16, 24, 25, the man who loses his life will save it. And it is because we help our neighbour in need, then we see the image of God in him. So these are the two foundations. So we must be clear. Firstly, the Christian anthropology and the meaning of life in scripture and tradition. Now, what are the threats uh, to human life? Now, in Saint Pope St. John's reading of the signs of the time, the threats against life are socially and legally acceptable today. The weakest and the most innocent are not spared. You look at the war in Gaza. 4,600 children have been killed. But not many people are saying anything about it. So it demonstrates, therefore, an enormous clash between good and evil, death and life, culture of death and the culture of life. Now, what are the factors 
Therefore, accounting for the culture of death today. Firstly, as I've said earlier, weak foundation for the dignity of the human person. If you see the human person just as another creature, maybe slightly better than the animals, then I don't think we're going to respect that person. You just imagine, if you truly believe that person is created the image of God, would you kill him? We don't have to go that far. If that person is your brother or your sister, would you kill? You will not. That's why St. Teresa of uh, Calcutta says, you know, abortion is such a great sin because just imagine a mother, if a mother can kill her own baby, there is no one else she can kill. If your own baby you can kill, who else you will not be able to kill? So, it is this lack of consciousness that we are created in the image of God. The corresponding human rights is derived from this dignity. But for the world, when they do not believe in God, they are, the point of departure is from it's not from faith in the ontology of the human person as coming from God, but because of his intellectual and moral rectitude, then it is a bit difficult because at the end of the day, if we are not agreeable as to who and what is a human person, we cannot agree on what are the human rights. And this applies to the current attitude towards life and gender and marriage as well. What is a human being? I don't think we agree about with those who are non-Christian. And in the face of moral relativism, the ontological question of who and what a human being is, as well as the corresponding dignity the human person has lacks foundation. That is the real problem with the world. That's why the human rights Argument of the world are very shaky. I will explain why. Now, the second reason is the new cultural climate, a relativistic climate. St. John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae number four says, uh, this new cultural climate uh, leads to a tragic end because people cannot distinguish between good and evil. Everything is negotiable. Everything is open to bargaining. Even the first of the fundamental rights, the right to life. Evangelium Vitae number 20. So the crimes and attacks described by Pope St. John Paul II, whatever is opposed to life, whether it's murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, slavery, prostitution, and so on. That's the second a relativistic culture because when you are relativistic, again, it depends on your personal reference or judgment. And thirdly, uh, Pope John Paul, uh, he diagnosed the real root of the cause, and which I totally agree. Actually, the real root cause of the cause is, of all these problems today, is because of moral evil. The fruit of sin. So, and the Pope uses these two terms, and the structure of sin, personal sin, Social sin. You know, it's good for us to remember, man is a product of society. But society is also a product of man. And so I think the danger today that many people are doing or are seeing is that uh, it is because of society. It is because of the world. They are not owning to their own personal sins. So structure of sin it's quite true. It's very serious, actually. But these two are interrelated. So when we speak about the structure of sin, we want to refer to the climate of this widespread moral uncertainty controlled by powerful cultural, economic, political currents. The conspiracy against life by international institutions, politicians, and mass media. And these have tremendous you can say, influence over the individual. 
because they control. And so it is true that the structures of society cause social sins of injustice in the sense that as systematic sins, they grow stronger, spread, become sources of other sin, conditioning human conduct. So the social reality of sin presents the antagonism between the culture of death and culture of life. As St. Paul makes it clear, the wages of sin, of course, is death. But before we blame the structure, we need, therefore, to turn to ourselves. Before there are structural sins or social sins, they begin with personal sins. It is the individuals in the society that are actually responsible for the creation and proliferation of such unjust structures. The danger for us to speak about structural sins is as if sin is impersonal. No, it is not impersonal. It is done by individuals. It begins with the individual. And when it is an individual sin, a personal sin, it influences others to sin, and then it becomes social sin. So the heart of the problem, therefore, is we have to go back to the root of the problem because of sin. Sin is the cause. Then there is another factor that is causing, you can say, um, um, this culture of death is the emphasis on efficiency, utility. Today, society is more concerned with the whether a person is useful or not. If you're not useful, you have no reason to live. And that is why today, if you are old, that's why, that's why even today, old people want to make themselves feel young. Because if you are old, people will say, uh, I, all the, I see all the aso asim will tell me, oh, Father, what lao leo, what useless la, bo la, bo la. Useless, useless, huh? because we are useless. But again, we begin to value the person in terms of what he can do. Not the ontological dignity of the human person. What can a child do? What can a baby do? You only give you more, but what can your dog do? Dog do can, no, actually, a dog is a losing business, you know. <laughs> you got to look after the dog day and night. <laughs> but what can the dog do? The dog cannot do much except to give you love. So, uh, every human person can give love. Even if you're elderly, actually, if you're elderly, even if you're immobile, your cheerfulness actually can inspire many people. It doesn't mean to say you have to be useful in the sense that you must be able to do something. But you see, in this world today, uh, Pope John Paul was the one who started this word, throwaway culture, huh? throwaway culture, which means to say that human beings are reduced to consumer goods. Are you useful? And this is where later on, and I think it becomes even more dangerous because there is a war of the powerful against the weak. So today, you know, those people who are not able to compete with the rest, that's why we, are, we say it's a survivor of the fittest. Those who are mentally challenged, physically challenged, we say we should just, you know, nowadays uh, when people are pregnant, they go for some tests and so on, and then the doctor says, no, we don't think this child will be that. We just eliminate the child because it will be a burden to us, a burden. But it is not true, huh? honestly. In the Catholic Church, we know we don't allow all these things. And those people, huh, when they have mentally, physically challenged child, that child becomes a source of unity in the family. All the siblings, all the parents, they'll be looking after this child. They'll be caring for this child. It's not necessary. It depends on whether the people are selfish or whether people are loving. So the next factor that... Uh, Promotes the culture of death is emphasis on individualism. And this has crept into a society. Today we speak of full autonomy, independence. And <clears throat> this spirit of self-centeredness can, can be seen very clearly in today's world. So the individual today reigns supreme. But you know, Christianity underscores the unity of human race and our social responsibility to each other. We are members 
of the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. And this love for our neighbor is very much emphasized in the scripture. So in the final analysis, you know, in Psalm 14, verse 1, 53, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So Pope John Paul II got it right. Secular humanism, Marxist communism and consumerism, they are the cause of the culture of death today. When God is eclipsed from our life, man is reduced to a thing not different from any other earthly creatures. And so man claims himself as his exclusive property rather than belonging to God. And I literally love this text in Romans 1, 18.31. St. Paul diagnosed the depraved condition of humanity as resulting from the sin of impiety. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And God gave them over to sin. So these are the factors that what we call promote the culture of death. Now, I want to deal very quickly with some of the tensions involving human rights because human rights, they are supposed to flow from the dignity of the human person. But then again, I told you, our dignity of the human person, the way we perceive the human person is different from that of the world. And therefore, now human rights today, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> And I really love what John Paul II said in Evangelium Vitae, number 18. He said, this talk about human rights huh, is a futile exercise of rhetoric. <laughs> futile exercise of rhetoric. Because why? The rich and the powerful, they talk so much about human rights, they're depriving of the poor, of undeveloped nations from rising, they're the one actually, on one hand, they promote human rights. On the other hand, they don't respect human rights. That's why, you know, sometimes I must share this with you. You know, as a bishop, I always get a lot of pressure, you know, even from my own people. <laughs> like, tahan, uh, huh? So they say, you know, uh, you know, bishop, you have to speak against the death penalty, you know. You know we, uh, how come you're not speaking against the death penalty? I said, I do, I promote a culture of life in every area, against abortion, against euthanasia, against all these things, but not only death penalty, including death penalty, but those people who are championing the elimination of death penalty, those people in the West, but they have no respect for other people. They are advocating euthanasia, they are advocating abortion. I mean, it's not consistent. If we want to promote the culture of life, it's from beginning until the end. Not selective. Not selective. So it's not enough to say we want to uh, promote what we call the removal of death penalty, but I think we need to see everything in its entire perspective. And so it is very true that today, rights are not mentioned in relation to duties. In fact, today, rights can be emphasize at the expense of duties. Everybody wants their rights, but they're not fulfilling their duties. So you want to speak about human rights, you want to speak about, uh, then you need, every right comes with its duty. Uh, uh, as a bishop, as a person in office, you are given certain privileges. Uh, privileges are not for you, hello. Uh, privileges are for you to serve better. I always remind people, huh? I always love this story, you know, which I heard. I never forget because it, it's important for me as a bishop, you know. Uh, so I like to tell you this story, you know. Uh, there was this guy, you know, he was a, a, a senior secretary of something like that, a like sub-secretary of state from states, and he was invited to give a talk, you know, do a big audience, big seminar. And when he arrived, he was, you know, fetched from the airport and brought to the hotel, and from the hotel, ushered to his room, and next morning they were waiting for him, brought him to the conference hall. Conference hall. When he reached the conference hall, they gave him a ceramic cup of tea, uh, coffee, and then he drank. 
Then after that, he was no more the Secretary of State, you know. So he was just the ordinary. He was invited to the same conference uh, two years later. This time, nobody fetched him at the airport. He has to take all the taxi by himself to the Enrich Hotel. Nobody welcomed him. He had to find his own way up and way, way down and went to the conference hall. Instead of coming from the front, from the, from the back, he came from the front and he was asking, can I have a cup of coffee? They gave him a foam cup. <laughs> yeah, because uh, the honour is not given to you. Honour is given for your office because you need it to do your work better. So, if we talk about rights, then we have to talk about responsibility. So, it is important that the church always defend and promote the rights of the individual, provided that the protection of human life is the first and most universal right. So, we cannot understand. How can you speak of abortion at the same time you uh, advocate euthanasia? It's inconsistent. Every life must be protected. It's not a selective choice, therefore. It's not something ideological. It is something based on the personal conviction of who a human being is. So, at the same time, it is important to recognize there are limits as to how one's rights and duties can be exercised. It at times can be very challenging for Christians to exercise our rights and duties in civil life because we are called to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. In normal cases, I don't think we have much tension between the state and the duties we need to perform because we know how to render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God because we are also part of a human community and so we need to respect the civil laws as well. So, this is where I think it's important for us to understand that while we have obligations towards the state, there is also this important um, reality of the freedom of conscience. So, in any given society, civil laws are necessary to ensure that we have a free just and peaceful life. All Christians are obliged to obey the civil law in order to safeguard the common good. The common good refers to the sum total of social conditions that each individual group can reach their fulfillment. That is the common good. So the laws of society are meant to protect the rights of the individual and society and to protect the common good. So as far as the church is concerned, at least that is how we Catholics hold, the church does not get involved in politics. Okay? This is not the task of the church. But the church, however, has a duty to pronounce moral judgment regarding public institution. But we do not get involved in partisan politics. Active participation in political parties is reserved to the faithful, not to the church by itself. So as individual Christians, of course, as a lay person in the world, you are called to participate in politics. And I think this is the real struggle, even for us as Catholics, you know. We need to put more of our Christian in civil service, in politics. It is important because when we talk about civil service, we talk about uh, politics, it is about protecting the common good of our people. It's not about proselytization. It is about upholding universal gospel values that are accepted by most people because they are values for life and for love. And I think this is where the real problem is because sometimes, you know, the world, society, wants us to keep quiet. They say, you cannot participate. Well, of course we can. We are private citizens. You speak as a private citizen. We don't speak as a church to prejudice society, but you speak as an individual and we need to speak up for the common good. So, and I feel that more lay people, therefore, should be involved in politics, in the civil life of the people, so that they are able to shape society and by participating in public environment. And so Pope Benedict, uh, 
uh, 16 in his encyclical, Deus Caritas S, he said something so beautiful. I must quote. Faith enables reason to do his work more effectively and to see his project, proper project more clearly. This is where the Catholic social doctrine has its place. It has no intention of giving the church power over the state. Even less is it an attempt to impose on those who do not share the faith, ways of thinking, and modes of conduct proper to faith. Its aim is simply to help purify reason and to contribute here and now to the acknowledgement and attainment of what is just. So our responsibility as Christians is to contribute to the public forum in order to shape society and to protect the common good. And we can help to what we call um, purify reason in order to explain to people in a logical, systematic way the values that we uphold. So in truth, a Christian cannot separate his private conscience from his, private, uh, from his public conduct. We cannot uh, be person opposed to abortion and still vote for, so to speak, pro-choice movement. And it's impossible, therefore, that we who... Uh, are dedicated to the worship of God, we also cannot neglect our temporal duties towards neighbour and towards God. In fact, some people think that it is permissible for agnosticism and relativism to exist in democratic institution. The truth is, democracy simply means that all of us must play our role. Democracy is a system, it is a means, uh, not an end. Itself. And so it's important, therefore, that uh, we have to speak the truth. I always tell people, either you evangelize the world or you'll be secularized by the world. Your choice. And I tell you honestly, because we are quiet, we are so good people, huh? we don't want to find trouble. And that is the reason why, because the minority does not speak, sorry, the majority does not speak, the minority speaks the loudest, and that becomes as if it is the, what we call, dominant voice. And we have to be very careful. Then, of course, we have the dictatorship of moral relativism, and that is also a real danger in a democratic system, because today in a democratic system, it is no longer based on objective moral law, it is based on preference not by objectivity. I, I see, I mean, no political institution is perfect. Huh? Honestly, democracy is not a very uh, perfect political institution because democracy, one man, one vote. Huh? Uh, a man who cannot think also has one vote. A man who can think intelligently also one vote. And how do we vote? I think this candidate is nah, quite handsome. Nah. Okay, nah, I think I vote. Nah. I mean, is it really because we have done an objective study of every candidate? Some who are more educated will do so, but in general, uh, 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 I saw, who do you want to vote? The one with the hammer. Ah. Okay, hammer, hammer, I go, I vote. I mean, come on. This one man, one vote system is not always, yes, there is freedom, but it is not. So at the end of the day, the government who is elected by the people, they will have to listen to the people. Even the people. That's why uh, our former uh, mentor, Minister Lee Kuan Yew says, last time it was the shepherd, uh, leader who leads the sheep. Now it's the sheep that leads the shepherd. That is the whole problem with the democratic system. Now we are, have to, whoever is elected, we have to do the bidding of the majority. And the bidding of the majority is not because we, all of us are all PhD students, analyze every situation. It's because we vote by what well, preference. I like it. Lah. How many of us already study? No, we, I like it. I think, I think, I like that, you know, the, the symbol of this party. It looks nice. I, I vote. I mean. So, this is where the real danger is happening. Now, there is certain tension uh, uh, between the state and uh, Christian reality. Uh, so, we have a few. I do not have the time, but uh, just to mention, firstly, is abortion. Okay? Abortion, the church is... Uh, very much against because it is really a direct killing of an innocent being. And euthanasia, assisted suicide, is also uh, prohibited by the church. But Pope 
John Paul II says, uh, euthanasia is a false mercy as true compassion leads to sharing another's pain. And one must not take care to confuse the decision to forego extraordinary or disproportionate forms of medical treatment as euthanasia. But what I'm afraid about euthanasia is a time will come when those who are weak and those who are useless, you might have to terminate your life not because you become an obstacle to the progress of others. What is something you choose yourself would soon become an obligation because you might be seen as selfish because you are not able to do things and your children are not able to have freedom to go and do what they want. And this death penalty, huh? i just say a few words about death penalty. Um, this question of death penalty, you know that uh, Shamungan, our Minister of Home Affairs, have already insisted that the death penalty is the way to uh, deal with drug issues. And he said something which I can appreciate. He says, one death or one capital punishment imposed on a drug trafficker is a tragedy where millions dying from the impact of drugs, drugs abuse is just a statistic. I mean, he has a point. He has a point. Uh, so the question is this. Uh, in the Catholic Church, a death penalty is uh, non-admissible in today's world. That is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches. Because uh, what is the purpose of a just law? The purpose of a just law is to make sure that the citizens are protected, there is safety, it is punitive, it is rehabilitative, and the last one is deterrence. Now, for our minister, uh, Shamungan, death penalty is a very powerful form of deterrence. Now, I want to say this, that although the church, as church, how, where do we stand as Catholics for us? You know, we do not agree with death penalty. We feel that every life is important and there is hope for everyone to be saved. Even a murderer can change his life. We should give the person a chance. And the church says, today death penalty can no longer be, uh, should no longer be used because we have the means to give safety to our people, to protect them from harm. At the same time, uh, we don't have to use uh, what we call killing in order to prevent such things from happening. But then, as I've said, uh, having said that, it's good for you to recognize that uh, while it is true, uh, there are some countries that cannot control drugs. There are some countries that uh, are powerless against drug addiction, against drug trafficking. In some countries, the penal system is very weak, unable to control, and the people are being harmed. So it's a question of where do you stand? Do you save one life at the expense of thousands of lives being destroyed? Or do we take one life and forget about the rest? So I have this to say, some comforting words from John Paul II. He says, supporting unjust law um, cannot be considered uh, what we call uh, it's not an illicit uh, cooperation with evil, but a legitimate and proper attempt to realize the common good. With illicit law. Huh? It's not illicit. I mean, because laws will always remain imperfect. And so, uh, even the church says, when you do so, it is not intrinsically evil. So, abortion and capital punishment, even if we submit to that law, is not intrinsically evil. But, as I've said, uh, for, if for good reasons, uh, we have to recognize that this is a pluralistic society. In that sense, uh, we, uh, a person would be able to submit to that law because of a very, what we call, of a pluralistic society and because it is ambiguous law because it is not intrinsically evil in a sense like if you take for example the capital punishment it's not intrinsically evil in Singapore because the attempt is actually to save more lives 
that is in the mind of the minister. But of course, for us, we would pray and we hope a day will come when we don't have to use death penalty and we are able to control uh, drug trafficking. That is our hope. And of course, there is one more last thing. It is the right to self-identity, but my time is up, okay? Um, so, this is also uh, another issue is regarding what we call uh, the question of sexual orientation and today the question of cancer culture. All these things have also been to be, uh, taken note of because today of cancer culture, uh, the irony is that we are afraid to proclaim the human rights uh, for fear of being silenced, for, being, for fear of being uh, what we call marginalised. And I think this is really frightening. You know, I, I just came back from the Synod Conference, you know, in, in Rome. And before that, I attended a, a seminar, one week seminar for some cardinals on transgender. And I came up of that conference, I realized that uh, same-sex union is not as dangerous for the church. It is something we intend, it's a transgender and it is happening all over Europe. At the age of 14, at the age of 14, uh, a child can decide on his or her sexual identity. And parents cannot stop. At the age of 14, they are already offered uh, sex reassignment. Just imagine, 14 is the age when you are still confused about your identity. And the most illogical thing is that you can choose your sexual identity for one year. So, to, so this year, I'm male. Next year, I decide to be a female. And year after, I become a male. You can, one year. Because biological status means nothing. It is how you feel that is important. I say, this is dangerous. So that's why in, in the Catholic Church, I say, maybe the problems will be solved because I ordained you know, this man to be a priest. And next year, he says a woman, so he became a woman priest. <laughs> I mean, sir, this is, but it is dangerous because it means to say a person at the age when he goes for sex reassignment, psychologically, he or she is damaged. But that is the reality. That is even more daunting than just what we call dealing with same-sex union. Okay, I think I have to stop here. Maybe other questions you can uh, ask me. Thank you.